So let me dive in and pick up kind of where we've been going so far since since I've been with you guys the whole the whole semester uh, semester the whole webinar series so far. Um, you know, I've enjoyed the arc that we've been traveling because it really sets up where we are today, right? So the, the first week we had, when we were talking about Native Americans in Texas and sort of this early period, and the first thing we talked about is how geography matters, right? And that we look at Texas right here, it affected, the geography did, where all the different Indian groups were that came into Texas, um, where they settled, and, and therefore, you know, in many ways, the power structure as it already existed when the Spaniards end up arriving in Texas, you know, with Cabeza de Vaca, but really um, in the 1680s when they show up um, following Robert Saul and all that. And then the early 1700s when they try to establish uh, a long-term presence in Texas. So we talked about different Indian groups in Texas and the power structures. Dr. Barr in the second week talked about how, you know, the geography of Texas that the Spanish come into is already a geography that's very established with native power in all these different directions, right? And so it's the Spaniards who come in and are, are figuring out this landscape and trying to set themselves up. And so last week, our third week, Dr. De La Teja talked a lot about the Spanish perspective in Texas during the 1700s. Um, and it's that period when you get the permanent settlements uh, under Spain within Texas, it's San Antonio, La Bahia, and Nacogdoches. And so here we have a, <laughs> a, a, a missionary from the, one of the documents Dr. De La Teja um, showed us last time. Um, it's really representative of how Spain wanted to settle Texas, right? Which is with the mission system. And you guys know that we've talked about that. Um, but one of the things that Dr. De La Teja talked about that I wanna pick up with, with today is how the mission system failed utterly to, to produce a permanent settlement in Texas for the Spanish where they could control the region. Um, because the natives in Texas had very little interest in going into the missions, right? The Caddo's in East Texas had zero interest. The Apaches and then later Comanches had almost no interest from the plains because they didn't need it. The Caranca was down on the coast, right? Had very little interest and, and didn't want to become Spaniards, so they never went into the missions. The only missions that did any good were around San or did any had any success were the ones around San Antonio because they were ministering the Khalil Tekken tribes down here in the valley. But you know, that, that also really didn't didn't produce long-term results the way the Spanish wanted. And the reason that matters, and this is where Dr. De La Teja left off and where I'm picking up today, is that by the time you get to 1800, all right. The mission system has failed in Texas, all right? And they've abandoned it. The Alamo, then known as the Valero mission, it's the first mission to get decommissioned in um, 1793. And then the Spanish basically just start decommissioning all the missions because it's not working. It's not pacifying the, the Indian groups as they had hoped that it would. And so you end up with things like San Saba right over here, right? And this, this guy gets killed um, and all of that. So Spanish pivot to a new system by 1800, which is, basically paying for peace. What they do is they, 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 they provide um, payments to the Native American groups to try to buy them off, essentially. Um, and that actually works pretty well. It turns out it's a lot cheaper to pay the Comanches not to kill you. And, and so the Spaniards would pay tribute to the Comanches. I think that, I wanna pause on that for just a second and point out to you guys. And I think it's worth pointing out to your students um, that by 1800, the Spaniards don't control Texas, and they know it. That's why they're paying the Indians not to attack them. It's really the Comanches and the other strong tribes in Texas that are calling the shots, and the Spaniards are just hanging out, right? So by 1800, you have only three settlements in Texas. You can see it on this map right here. Right? You've got San Antonio, right? which has about 1,500 people by 1800. Down the road, you've got La Bahia, which will later be Goliad. They'll rename it in 1828 Goliad, but it's La Bahia, right? It's got about 500 or so people, not very many. And then here in East Texas, you have Nacogdoches, which has about 800 people or so, right? And that's it. You've got about 3,000, maybe if you round up and are generous, 4,000 Spaniards in Texas, right? How many Indians do you have? About 30,000. Right, so this is this is not Spanish Texas, right? This is Indian country. I think is the best way to to think about the territory, much as Dr. Barr was describing on the second week of all of this, right? My point is, the Spanish presence in Texas by 1800 is super weak. Okay, 20 years later, it's going to be 
much, much weaker somehow, right? And so the, the question I want us to address with, with my talk today, and what I always kind of frame this period for with my students is kind of a guiding question, something to, to, to wrap this period around for them is the question of why did Spain's presence in Texas go from being tremendously weak in 1800 to the brink of collapse by 1820, right? As my, my son used to say a long time ago, it went from bad to badder, the most bad. <laughs> like things just keep getting worse. And, and that's, that's important to set up because only if you understand why Spain's presence collapses so badly by 1820 can you understand why the Spaniards in Texas will be open to allowing Anglo-Americans to come into Texas in 1821. Um, with the Austin proposal and all that comes with that. So in many ways what we're doing is we're setting up the end of both Spanish Texas, the beginning of Mexican Texas, and really the shift that's gonna happen where Anglo-Americans start coming in and why that would actually take place, right? I'm gonna try to answer this question about, about what happens to the three, right? And the answer to the question essentially comes down to, there's a couple of, of major problems as I always call them, or you can call them mild disasters that befall the Spanish from 1800 all the way up to 1820. And when you line them all up like dominoes, it's, it, it may suddenly make sense why the Spanish presence in Texas is completely falling apart by the time Moses Austin comes strolling into San Antonio in December of 1820. Um, so we're gonna walk through a couple of these in a row and sort of get a sense of how this shift is happening, right? So major problem number one, the United States is now your new neighbor, Spain. <laughs> and so this is this is of course the Louisiana Purchase, right? And and this is you know this is spiraling content for eighth grade U.S. history. Um, and I'm sure your students vaguely recall this when they get to seventh grade if they've heard it somewhere else. But in 1803, um, French, what's Napoleon actually, who sells Louisiana and all its glory to the United States, and you know, the president of the United States at the time is, is Thomas Jefferson, and he's thrilled and excited about, uh, about getting Louisiana because he can double the size of the United States, which from Jefferson's perspective will, will ensure land and therefore liberty to American citizens from there going forward into the future. Okay? But here's the thing, and when we talk about this in U.S. history, we never touch on this point, but it's important to set it up, I think, when we talk about Texas history, is that the borders of Louisiana were really vague and never clearly established. There's no like big signposts everywhere saying this is Louisiana over here, right? Um, when Robert LaSalle claimed the Mississippi River and all the rivers that flowed into it, it's a very broad, vague sort of um, definition. And so Thomas Jefferson decided to take that to his advantage. And he decided to claim that Louisiana included Texas. What's he basing this off of? Well, Texas history, right? Um, specifically, Robert LaSalle, right, who lands in Matagorda Bay in 1685. Um, most historians say he got lost and landed there on accident. Um, as we heard under Dr. De La Teja, some historians think maybe he went there on purpose. However he gets there, right, he's wandering around Texas vaguely. And Jefferson claims that that means it's a part of Louisiana because it's LaSalle who claimed Louisiana, right? And the reason I bring all that up is simply to say, hey, this is a problem for the Spanish because the Spanish don't necessarily care about Texas, but they do care about the United States getting closer and closer to the Spanish silver mines and presence and all that sort of stuff. And so the fact that they have so few people in Texas is now a new problem for them because the United States is now expanding toward the Spanish slash Spanish hyphen Texas border. Um, and so the Spanish monarchy and the Spanish um, legal regime in Mexico City is looking at all this and getting increasingly nervous, right? And this is something that shows up um, in the teaks. Um, so when you guys hit um, the sporting standard 7.2b, which talks about conflicting territorial, territorial claims between Spain and France over Texas, Louisiana is all part of all of that. And now it's a, a, a battle between Spain and, and going to be the United States because uh, Thomas Jefferson is not going to back off this claim and it won't get settled until 1819, right? So the point of all this is it makes Spain nervous, right? They don't like this. And now they've got to 
send more people to Texas or find some way to populate it, because with only 3,000, 4,000 people there, they don't have a strong claim to the territory. But then the Spanish regime runs into a problem, so they can't send people up to Texas because suddenly they have this Mexican war for independence that they have to deal with, all right? So this is another major context that breaks out at this time that makes it hard for Spain to deal with their problems in Texas, right? So when I talk about this with my students, I always kind of back the camera out a little bit and I say, all right, let's talk a little bit about New Spain, right? And, and why there was a Mexican war for independence, because it helps us understand how that affects Texas. There's an important context to give our students, right? So this is New Spain, right? You see the map right here and the province of Texas up there in the you know upper Northeast kind of back behind the, 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 the shed in the backyard as Dr. De La Teja said um, last week. Um, this, is, this is one of the jewels of the Spanish empire. And the reason it is, is because New Spain is essentially acting as an ATM for the Spanish empire, right? New Spain here um, is pumping out enormous amounts of silver that's being loaded onto ships and sent across the ocean to Madrid, which is making the Spanish empire wealthy and militarily extremely powerful, right? And the reason is they find an enormous amount of silver north of Mexico City, up in the mountains, um, going up towards Zacatecas, right? So here's Mexico City down here, um, going up the mountain range this direction, north and westward from there, they're finding all these veins of silver that they're mining, pulling out, sending to Mexico City. And from there, they're being loaded on ships in Veracruz and sent across the ocean to Madrid, right? And over the course of several centuries, this put, pushes a huge amount of silver over to Spanish uh, monarchy, and it's making them a lot of money and they're doing really well. Um, and it, it's so profitable that the Spanish monarchy holds a very tight control over this entire system. So if you're the Spanish king, right, and all this is going on, who are you going to put in charge of monitoring all this silver movement and all your money, essentially, that's being brought out of, uh, out of New Spain? people who are close to you and right? people who you trust. And so the people who are put into all the really good positions are from Spanish families that are very close to the monarchy within Spain, right? And, and so there's a very small group of people that have most of the really good paying jobs and most of the power, right? And they're all people from Spain itself. And there's another reason that there's nobody, uh, that everybody from Spain are the ones that have. <laughs> Hey Ernest, I think your uh, your audio is on. If you could turn that off and, and mute it, that'd be that'd, that'd be helpful. I'd appreciate. It. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Um, so, all the people from Spain are the ones that have all the power. Everybody else is sort of out of power. And and a good and you can see this in the the structure of the Spanish social system um, by 1800. Right, you've got this very small group. So this is like all the people within New Spain. Right. And at the very top of this power structure are what are called the peninsulares, right? These are people from Spain, from the peninsula of Spain, who you can see there's very few of them, there's 15,000. These are the guys with all the great positions. These are the guys with all the power. These are the guys with influence, right? And there's a tiny group of them. Beneath them are Creoles or Criollos in Spanish. And these are people who were born in the Americas. They have Spanish parents, like. Dad Spanish, mom Spanish, and they were, their parents are from Spain, but they came over to the New World and they had a kid, and that kid was born in the Americas. And you got to understand, at this time in Europe, almost all Europeans felt that anything that was from the Americas was eh, kind of degenerate, right? Not quite as good as as what would be in Europe. Everything in Europe was considered the best, so everything that would be in the Americas. Eh, you know, a dirtier, littler version of, of anything. So you might have Spanish parents, but if you were born in the Americas, you're considered lesser, little degenerate, not quite as good. And so you're going to be separated from the, the top of the pyramid. You're not going to have access to the best jobs and the best positions because the Spanish monarchy reserves those from people from Spain itself, right? And then below that, you've got mestizos, right? And these are people who have both Spanish and Indian ancestry, right? Like mom or dad most likely was a Spaniard and then your other parent was uh, was an Indian. And, and so, you know, if being born in the Americas puts you down the ladder, 
being of the Americas with having Indian ancestry will definitely put you even further down the ladder itself in the Spanish system, right? And so these people are considered below Creoles and are even further down. And then beneath them are the Indians who make up the actually the vast majority of the people who lived in New Spain, who are fully of the Americas, they have no Spanish blood, and therefore they are really considered at the very bottom of all of this, all right? I say all of this to point out to you guys that you know, what brought on the, the, the Mexican War for Independence was a lot of frustration by absolutely everybody except the Peninsulares at the very top of this pyramid, right? So all of these guys are angry and upset. And actually the ones who are the most positioned to do something about it are the ones who are closest to the top, but not quite there, the Creoles, right? So the Mexican War for Independence breaks out um, kind of as a revolt amongst Creoles that are just close to the top that can't quite reach all the way up to what they really want to get. Um, and I'm sure most of you guys know a lot of this story, but uh, the, there's a, a revolt that's being put together by a group of Creoles, um, the most famous of which was this man down here, Father Miguel Hidalgo, um, who are, which there's has a great history with this guy. Um, he's, he's a fascinating character all by himself. He's a parish priest um, who lived a very colorful life. But um, he's a part of this Creole little rebellion group. And so he issues a, a declaration called the uh, uh, Grito de Dolores on September 16th, 1810, which has become Mexico's Independence Day. And um, it's not really a cry for independence. It's actually a, a cry for good governance under the Spanish system. But when he issues this, this, this revolt, basically, against the Spanish Empire, um, Creoles are interested, but it's actually the Mestizos and the Indians, those big groups at the bottom of the pyramid, who most react to, to Father Hidalgo's cry. And this is important stuff to bring up, because as you'll see right here, um, it's in the teaks that we need to talk about Father Hidalgo, right? And so we need to talk about Mexican history and Spanish history, but here, but the, the origins of Mexico as this context around um, how, how Texas develops during, during this time period, right? So Hidalgo has this revolt, right? And he suddenly, within a couple of weeks, it's really remarkable, um, he suddenly has this massive army that, that builds up around him and behind him, and he starts marching south from his position down toward Mexico City. Um, and along the way, his army sacks and destroys the, the town of Guanajuato, um, where they actually murder and kill not just um, peninsulares, but actually a lot of Creoles as well. And it's a real bloody, violent disaster um, in, in, in Guanajuato. Um, Hidalgo makes his way down towards Mexico City. And we could fight the, all of these battles and it'd be really interesting. He doesn't storm Mexico City for whatever reason, the Spanish military then rallies, and then in January of 1811, they, they attack him and push him back. And so Hidalgo starts retreating northward from there, and this begins the Mexican War for Independence, which will go on until 1821. Um, Hidalgo himself, he's going to retreat up to, to Coahuila. So for those of us who know that Coahuila and Texas have a long history, uh, Hidalgo is going to get captured and then killed in, uh, in Coahuila um, later on. But the reason this matters, all right, why you have to not just know that context, but we have to explain it to our students is that all of this brings an enormous amount of violence to Texas, right? That's, that's what matters about the Mexican War for Independence, is that it, it sparks an enormous amount of violence that will change Texas and really weaken the Spanish position in the region, right? Because as soon as this begins, you have little revolts that go on in Texas, right? So the Juan Batista de las Casas revolt in 1811, this happens in actually January of 1811, you know, when Hidalgo is actually fighting outside Mexico City, um, uh, de las Casas, he, 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 he's a captain, he goes into San Antonio and has a little military coup where he takes over San Antonio, which is the capital of Texas at this time, and they capture the governor, Emmanuel Salcedo, and and you know it's a it's a it's a pretty bloodless coup overall. Um, de las Casas though he turns out to be kind of a brute, and hacks off a lot of the Spanish families, the Tejanos who live in San Antonio. So they turn against him, and then he gets captured and thrown out, and and that's the end of that little that little rebellion. Right. More important is Jose Bernardo Gutierrez de Lara. Right? I know you guys, you know about the Gutierrez-McGee expedition, right? Um, but 
Jose Bernardo Gutierrez is an incredibly important figure. He also shows up in directly in the teats within the context of this arc, all right? I just want to emphasize for you guys, uh, Gutierrez de Lara, he, his goal here is that he is an agent uh, of this revolt against Spain and a part of what Hidalgo has begun. And so um, Gutierrez, he goes you know, up through Texas on his way to the United States. And then he goes to the United States to ask for help in this rebellion, right? And he travels all the way up to Washington, D.C., which my students always find fascinating. He went all the way up to Washington, D.C. to meet with the United States, right? He meets with President Madison, um, asks for help for the rebellion, um, doesn't get any help. Uh, there's always been a lot of speculation of whether the United States secretly was helping the rebellion. The United States definitely wanted the rebellion to, to succeed. We were very much in favor of overthrowing the Spanish any chance we had. Um, the United States was about to get into a war with Great Britain at this time, so that wasn't really in the offing for the United States. So Gutierrez, who's frustrated by this, of course, he comes down back toward uh, northern New Spain, towards Texas, and he decides he's going to build a little army of his own for rebellion. He needs to recruit people for this. So he goes to the best place he could possibly think of to find angry young men who might want to be a part of a rebellion of some sort. He goes to New Orleans where he goes to the bars <laughs> and, uh, and he starts recruiting. And he runs into a, a guy named Augustus McGee who uh, had training at West Point. So he had some military experience. Um, and Gutierrez and McGee team up for the famous Gutierrez-McGee expedition, right? And they recruit a bunch of Americans to be a part of this army of liberation. And so in August of 1812, Gutierrez and McGee lead a group of about 130 guys into Texas, right? Where they come through Nacogdoches and then they make their way over to San Antonio de Beja, right? And what I want to emphasize is that Gutierrez comes in with 130 Americans and then he starts recruiting Tejanos, the Spaniards in Texas, uh, along the way. And the army starts swelling by the dozens and then ultimately hundreds uh, of men because the Spaniards in Texas didn't feel a lot of loyalty to the, the regime in Mexico City, which seemed so far away and wasn't really seeming to do very much for them. So this expedition gets over to San Antonio. They capture the governor again, Manuel Salcedo, which you got to imagine this poor guy, Salcedo, right? He'd just been captured by, um, by one rebellion and gotten out, and then they capture him again. Um, unfortunately for him, uh, Gutierrez's men uh, slit the governor's throat and kill him. And so by 1812, you know, Texas is being controlled now by the rebellion, right? What, what Hidalgo had begun in Mexico has now succeeded, at least in Texas, in overthrowing Spanish royal authority because they just murdered the governor, right? <laughs> this, is, this is big stuff, right? And, and I would ask my students, like, if you're in Mexico City and you're the viceroy, right, how do you imagine Spanish authorities are reacting to this? And, you know, they mull on it for a second and go, they're probably not happy. I'm like, like yeah, that's true. They are not happy. But they are super not happy. And so the viceroy in Mexico City he decides to um, find the guy who he thinks will most violently put down this rebellion. Because if you're in viceroy, you want to put this down and you also want to send the message that this is not okay. Right? You're not doing this anymore. This is not cool. And so Viceroy um, taps a, a gentleman named um, Joaquin, Jose Joaquin de Aridanda. And I'm, I, I hope you've heard of Aridanda. Um, he was, he had been governor of what was Nuevo Santander, modern day Tamaulipas, for a while. Um, he was a brutal military man. And his nickname was the Butcher, if that gives you any indication of, of kind of what Aridanda was about. And they tell Aridanda, all right, hey, put together an army and destroy this rebellion, please. And uh, you don't really care how you do it. Just go ahead and, and, and make mincemeat of the rebels if you possibly can. So Aridanda says, yeah, that's what I can do. All right. So he gets his army together and he starts moving north uh, into northern Mexico. And he puts together an army along the way of about 1,800 men that you know, cross the Rio Grande, which is not the border of Texas at this time, 
uh, crosses an oasis, which historically was the border of Texas. And he makes his way toward this, uh, the capital of Texas, San Antonio de Beja. And as he's approaching the capital, the rebels inside San Antonio hear that he's coming and they realize there's a Spanish army approaching. And they decide that the best thing they can do is to ride out and meet this, uh, this Spanish army um, south of San Antonio. So the, the rebels come marching out of San Antonio and come south from there. And they meet up with Aridondo's army at the Medina River, right? And so when they meet up at the Medina River, um, they slam into each other in battle in, on August 18th, 1813, right? And I always tell my students, that's a really important date in Texas history, August 18th, 1813, because the Battle of Medina, even though we don't really know exactly where it happened today, we know it's near the Medina River, there's competing theories about where the actual location of the battle was. But what we do know about the battle, right? Here's an artist's rendition of what some of that battle might have looked like, um, is that it was the bloodiest battle in all of Texas history. Up until the present day, there's never been a bloodier, um, more violent um, battle with, fought within the borders of Texas than the Battle of Medina, all right? And it was a one-sided slaughter fest, all right? I want to emphasize that. Um, it's also incredibly important because we have, this, again, the Teeks um, standards right here that the Battle of Medina is something that we need to cover. And this is where Ari Dondo is, is talking, is, is, is reclaiming Texas for royal control. And his very well-trained troops just destroy the untrained, uh, unorganized, uh, untested rebels, right? And the numbers are, are pretty stark. So let me, let me show you guys a, a couple of, uh, numbers I always give my students, right? There's about 1,400 rebels, all right? Which every time I say rebels and rebellion, my students always think of Star Wars now. But um, of the 1,400 rebels, all of them are killed except 100, right? Uh, 1,300 die in this battle, right? That's why it's one of the bloodiest battles in Texas history. But Aridondo's troops, very few of them are, are killed. Um, of Aridondo's 1,800, only 50 die. So you can do this math really fast, right? Almost all the people who die are on the rebel side and virtually none of Aridondo's soldiers die. It's a one-sided slaughter fest, if there ever there has been one, right? And I mean, that's a testament to Aridondo and to his troops and to the disorganization of the rebels itself. But why it matters is that it inaugurates this period where Aridondo reasserts royal control over Texas. And when he does that, he does it in such a brutal, horrifically violent fashion that it absolutely devastates the Spanish presence in Texas, right? So if there's any like one pivotal moment in what makes the Spanish presence super um, weak in Texas by 1820, it's this, right? When Arredondo wins the, the Battle of Medina, he then unleashes you know, violence across the rest of Texas because he's trying to reclaim it from the rebel, right? And so I, I love this, um, this image of San Antonio. I know most of you guys have seen it and I hope you guys get a chance to use it in your classes because it's, really, it's a really beautiful image uh, of the, one of the plazas and there's the San Fernando Church right here. But I use it right now because after the Battle of Medina, right, um, that's just the beginning of, of the revenge of Arredondo and Spanish authorities. And there are some survivors from the battle, right? Of that hundred that didn't get killed. They run away from the battlefield, the rebels. And they come into San Antonio, the nearest town. And they're screaming the alarm. They're saying, oh my goodness, they killed all of us. Get out as fast as you can, right? Like you see this guy in the horseback galloping through the plaza right here. I always imagine him as one of those riders who came back from the battle screaming at the top of his lungs. They've killed us all. Everybody get out because panic just ensued across San Antonio in the aftermath of Arredondo's victory. And everybody in town started packing up their bags. They threw everything they could grab into saddlebags. If you had a cart, they threw it into carts and, and they got out of town. They, got as, they started driving their horses and were walking as fast as they could out of San Antonio, right? Why? What do they have to fear? Um, what they have to fear is that Aridondo is going to take revenge, not just on the soldiers who are fighting against him, but the families of those people, 
who had supported them, right? So every dead man on the field was somebody's husband, somebody's father, somebody's son, somebody's uncle. And all those people are likely to get the, the harsh uh, hand of revenge from Arredondo. So everybody panics and tries to get out of town. Those who can't run power in terror and are desperate to, to, to try to hide. Um, and it turns out they had every reason to be nervous because Arredondo, once he's destroyed the rebels on the battlefield, he has his soldiers march into San Antonio where they reclaim the Spanish capital and they've reclaimed the region with that. And when they come into town, they capture everybody. Like every Spaniard in, in San Antonio is suspect. He throws them all into, into whatever jail he can create. There's no, I mean, there are jail. There's a jail in San Antonio, but it's tiny. So he starts throwing everybody into the churches, right? The San Fernando church here, for example. And he squeezes people in so tight that overnight, uh, a dozen people suffocate for lack of oxygen. And then the next day, um, in the aftermath of all this, Arredondo pulls everybody out of the plaza and then he starts slowly executing people over the like three a day for a very long time where he ends up killing over 300 people in San Antonio as a message that if you resist the Spanish regime, you're going to pay, right? And so he brutally reasserts control, but he's not even done there because all those people who ran from San Antonio, they're leaving on the Camino Real, right? also called San Antonio Road here, but the Royal Road. They're coming out of San Antonio and they're making their way east as fast as they can. But every time they get through a river, right? Especially these big ones like the Colorado or the Brazos or the Trinity, those are hard to cross in an era before bridges. Um, and so not that they had invented bridges yet, we just didn't have them in Texas. But you know, you have all these families that are trying to get out and they get stuck with these rivers and Arredondo sent out the cavalry to hunt them down. And so at every river crossing, these families are desperately trying to get across and Arredondo's soldiers would ride up and then just stab to death with lances, any men they could come across. The women they would capture and haul back to San Antonio and if there's any kids, they just left them to die or straggle along behind them on their way back to San Antonio. And in San Antonio, they would then imprison the women and it was just absolutely awful. So the reason I tell you all all right, the, the payout in all of this in terms of explaining what happened to Texas is that over the course of this rebellion, um, Arredondo, when he reclaimed Texas, he kills about a thousand Spaniards in Texas. And then he runs another 1,000 out of Texas and they go hide in Louisiana, right? So all the Spaniards who live in Nacogdoches just abandon Nacogdoches. And they run to Louisiana because they've heard Arredondo's troops are coming and they're going to kill anybody they get their hands on, right? And so the reason that matters is if you kill a thousand Tejanos and you run another thousand out of Texas, you've eliminated 2,000 Spaniards from Texas. How many do we have to start? 3,000, 4,000? Let's round up. Let's just round up and, and be generous and say you had 4,000, right? If you had 4,000, like now you've cut it in half, all right? So again, if we're talking about, you know, Teak standard 7.2 D, right? When you're talking about Texas's involvement in the fight for independence in Mexico, this is it, right? The violence that comes to Texas as a part of this uh, war for independence decimates the weak Spanish position in Texas. It just cuts it absolutely in half. It wasn't strong to start. And now it's half as strong as it was. That's a really bad situation um, for, for Spain if they're gonna to try to hold on to this territory. So the brutality of Arredondo and the Spanish empire really weakens the position uh, in the territory long-term. And then things get worse because you run into major problem number three, which is Indian raiding. Comanches and Apaches specifically, increases dramatically after the Gutierrez-McGee expedition and the Arredondo revenge that follows, right? So here, this is one of my favorite um, paintings from Texas history. This is the Comanches. Um, it's a beautiful image of the Comanches and, and so useful in so many ways. I, I show this picture to my students and they always ask like, why were there unicorns in Texas at this time? <laughs> I think it's funny. Um, but the Comanches realized that 
after Aridondo has destroyed the Tejanos, oh, and by the way, Aridondo then um, confiscates all the weapons that the Tejanos, the Spaniards in San Antonio had. He takes all their weapons too. So when Aridondo leaves Texas, the Tejanos are sitting around with no weapons either. And the, and the Comanches realize this. And so they start raiding San Antonio because the Spaniards who live there are sitting ducks and literally can't do anything to defend themselves now. And the Comanches take full advantage of this, right? And then the Comanches um, start not just raiding San Antonio, but stealing every horse they possibly can because at the same time, remember the Louisiana Purchase? Well, that brought all these people to, you guessed it, Louisiana, but also Mississippi and Alabama to the, to the east here. There's a lot of Americans over here. You know what they want a lot of? Horses. They want a lot of horses. And so you have American traders who start coming into Texas looking for horses. And they start going to the Comanches to get horses. And they establish this new road called Camino Comanche, right? coming out of Nacogdoches, going up to Comanche territory. Where they start buying horses. What do the Americans have um, to give the Comanches in exchange for horses? Weapons, right? Um, and so the Comanches are very happy to buy rifles and, and, and guns and gunpowder and, and shot and all kinds of stuff from the Americans in exchange for horses. So you have this big trade that's going on and the Comanches realize that a safe place to get lots of horses are places like San Antonio or La Bahia. And so the Comanches absolutely destroy all of these territories and start raiding San Antonio and La Bahia into the ground, all right, in the aftermath of all of this. And the the Tejanos, the Spaniards in San Antonio, literally can't defend themselves. There's really much, nothing much they can do. So in many ways, what we've got here by late 18-teens, by 1820, is that this is even more Indian country by now. Because the, the, the Native American groups that we started with are the ones calling the shots. Right? And everything that Dr. Barr talked about with the geography of this territory being controlled by the Indians is more true than it has ever been up until now, all right? And that is important because when we have major problem number four, which is with all of this going on, with Spain as weak as it's ever been in Texas, all right, with the Tejanos on the ropes quite literally, right? Then you have American filibusters who come traipsing across the Sabine River and coming into Texas. And, and the reason that matters is that Spain can do almost nothing about it. So when we talk about all of this, I always tell my students the, the key context is that, so Louisiana Purchase, we don't have a clear line between Louisiana, between the United States and Spain. Um, that gets negotiated and is settled by the adams onis Treaty um, of 1819, right? Don Quincy Adams and Luis Onis of the Spanish Empire agree that it's going to be Sabine River and the Red River are going to be the lines between Spain and the United States. United States gets Florida, and basically Spain gets Texas. Um, that's all fine and dandy, and the United States was very happy to have Florida. But there were a lot of Americans in Louisiana and Mississippi who didn't want to give up Texas and thought it rightfully should be a part of the United States. And so you have these little expedition filibuster groups who start coming into Texas. And James Long is the most famous example of these, right? He comes in in 1819 with 300 guys. Kind of hangs out for a while, but there's not much the Spanish can really do because they don't have a presence in Nacogdoches anymore of any real consequence. They send a military expedition that chases James Long back to the United States, and then Long comes back this time with 50 guys in 1821. But the point is, there's really not much the Spanish can do. Their weakened position has gotten so weak that they're literally at the mercy of whatever the Americans want to do along this border, and they recognize that. And that's one thing for Mexico City. For the Tejanos to actually live here in San Antonio or La Bahia, right? That's terrifying. And really forms a lot of their understanding of what on earth can they do to try to better their situation in Texas, which has been really pretty weak since, since the early 1700s, right? And so Texas, by the time you get to 1820, is, is a shambles under the Spanish Empire. So when we go back to our original question. Why did Spain's presence in Texas go from tremendously weak to the brink of collapse by 1820? It's these series of challenges that all kind of surround the Spaniards in Texas. The American neighbors with Louisiana Purchase, the Mexican War for Independence and the violence that that brings, that then allows the Native Americans to raid like they've almost never raided before, that then opens up the Americans to come back to problem number one, who can just come in and, at will 
and Spain can almost do nothing about it, all right? Knowing that matters enormously because if we don't understand that, then we can't understand what it was like to be a Tejano in Texas at this moment, right? This is Jose Antonio Navarro, right? I'm sure a lot of you guys recognize him. He's gonna be key in what happens next when Stephen F. Austin shows up in Texas, right? But we have to understand Navarro's perspective. If we're gonna understand why he wants to work with Stephen F. Austin, right? How does Navarro and the other Tejanos who live in the region see what's going on by 1820? Well, they see a lot of problems. And ones they don't have good, any good solutions for, right? They've been decimated by the Mexican War for Independence. I mean, absolutely destroyed by it, right? They could do nothing to stop the Anglo-Americans who are now coming into Texas like James Long, nothing really. And they don't even know when it's happening because they don't have eyes on the border over there. They don't have any way of solving the problem, what they call the Indian problem, the Comanches and Apaches. And we're gonna read some stuff in the documents after the Q&A session that's really gonna emphasize that. And here's the kicker, right? Throughout all of this, they've gotten zero support from Mexico City. Like just nothing is what it feels like to them. And they're beyond frustrated. They're saying to themselves, how on earth are we going to get any help? What's going to change all of this? What could possibly be different going forward, right? And that's when something does happen, right? And I'm not talking about the Moses Austin showing up. We'll talk about that later. Um, I'm talking about Spain loses Mexico, right? It's at this moment when Texas is at its weakest in terms of the Tejanos uh, in Texas, that the Mexican War for Independence succeeds in the spring of 1821. And Mexico becomes an independent country, right? And now it has to decide a lot of things. How is it gonna become a new nation? What's gonna look like? But how are they gonna deal with the situation now in Texas? this weakness that they've inherited from the Spanish. So everything that went wrong for Spain is now Mexico's problem, right? And they've got to find a solution for it. They didn't create these problems, but now they got to deal with them, right? And that's the story of when we get Moses Austin showing up because you have huge numbers of people in the American South, right? 150,000 in Louisiana, 75,000 in Mississippi, 144,000 in Alabama, 370,000 people have moved into the territory right next to Texas and maybe you've got 3,000 Tejanos in the territory here. Solving that question and figuring out what to do next is how we get into the period of the Mexican era that some of you apparently are, are, are in and are finishing right now in your own classrooms, where we get what Tejanos we're going to do when Stephen F. Austin shows up and how Texas gets remade in fundamental ways going forward from there. So um, with that, I'm going to pause.